Good morning. It's an absolute pleasure for me to be here this morning. Um, my name is Jack Wong. I'm the Executive Officer of the Real Estate Foundation of BC, and uh, I'll be chairing the session on co-housing this morning. Um, I'm going to take a second just to uh, just let those of you who don't know too much about the Real Estate Foundation. Uh, we're not the real estate industry. We're associated with the real estate industry, and we're not government. Uh, uh, in fact, we're, we're a grant maker. Uh, we, we fund uh, provincially. Uh, we were created by provincial legislation back in 1985, and the Real Estate Foundation's purpose is to undertake public and professional uh, education, law reform, and research in relation to real estate activities and land use. Um, we do this mainly by, by awarding grants, and in fact, uh, since we were established in 1985, over 25 years, we've uh, granted over $65 million uh, throughout the province to over 100 communities. Uh, back in 1989, uh, one of our grants was uh, to create uh, SFU's uh, uh, fund for housing and community environments for the elderly. And this was a, a fund that was utilized to establish a position for a, of a research fellow in gerontology at SFU. And the creation of this fund was, has enabled the university's uh, center to continue and further <coughs> develop its programs of research, education, information services on the housing needs of Canada's elderly. Um, but as we age, people often pr presume that retirement homes or institutional care are the only alternatives to living independently in your own home. However, there's usually long wait, wait lists and often at high costs. Although most people want to live at home for as long as possible, comprehensive home care options are not yet readily available or affordable. Beyond the call for more affordable housing and rent subsidies, other housing alternatives need to be made available. Co-housing is two, co-housing defined is two or more individuals sharing a home and its related costs where each has their own private space but share common areas like the kitchen and living room. And you hear a lot more about that uh, with, from our panelists. This allows individuals to live in independent lives while having access to assistance and companionship from one another. It lowers housing costs and related expenses since they are shared and can be coordinated with support services such as meal preparations, transportation, housekeeping, and organization of recreational activities. So I'm pleased to set up this, uh, this morning's panel, and I'm going to introduce uh, them uh, 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 one at a time, and I'll call them up uh, one at a time. But uh, just to kind of give you a taste of, of who these people are, Full bios are in your, in your package, so I won't get into a lot of detail. So on my immediate right, we're going to, have, we're going to start off with Charles Durrett. Uh, is an architect and author uh, based in California, I still believe. And along with his partner, Catherine, uh, is credited with introducing the co-housing model to North America. Following Charles, we have Tricia Carpenter, is a resident of Winsong Co-Housing in Langley, B.C., and then we have Margaret Critchlow, who is the president of the Canadian Senior Co-Housing Society. And following Margaret, we'll have Alan Forrester of Forrester Development Corporation, who is in a, which is an award-winning green developer who have been involved with many family-friendly co-housing projects in Vancouver. So without uh, further ado, I'm going to turn the over, uh, mic over to Charles. Thank you. Thanks very much, Jack. Appreciate it. Yes, hello, welcome everybody. I'm so happy to be here. Um, my name is Chuck Durrett, and um, I'm an architect, as Jack mentioned, um, which means I usually have slides. I don't have any today, so I'm just the warm up for the locals here. Um, <laughs> and I have uh, uh, plenty of images for this evening, so I hope you can make it back at, at 7 o'clock. Um, you know, as an architect, um, uh, I was highly motivated to look at solutions that really solved you know, social issues. Um, I, I went to, uh, I went to uh, the University of Copenhagen in, in Denmark and I decided to do that after looking at, I, I ended up, originally went to the largest architecture school in the US, California Polytechnic, and it's in the middle of nowhere quite inappropriately. But um, so, um, you know, uh, when it came time to uh, decide on a year abroad where to go. There was five countries available. And of all the five, there was one place that I found quite effectively were turning two-dimensional goals, i.e. the written word, into the third dimension. Architects there are a very active lot. Most cultures have 
one profession that stands out as a, an activist group in the in the U.S. It's the uh, ACLU in uh, France. It's Doctors Without Borders, etc. And in Denmark, the architects play a big role in um, you know moving that society forward. Um, you know, quite active and, and and a lot of advocacy in their role. And so it doesn't take long for them to figure out that there's a problem and then to uh, translate that into the third dimension, start designing solutions to, to accomplish it. Um, and it worked out perfectly for me because I, um, I uh, live both in a very small town of 325 people. You'll see some images tonight. And, uh, and in the suburbs of Sacramento, my parents were divorced. I spent half the time in, in the small town of Downeyville. The whole county only had 3,000 people in the forest, the northern, very northern part of California. And then this very anonymous suburban world, very much connected by roads and shopping centers and, and you know, quite an anonymous landscape. Um, year after year, as I was growing older, I kept noticing how um, one environment was incredibly supportive with people who played a role in the society that helped move the society forward, real elders, if you will, people who, for whom if you, for example, honked your horn after dark, they would come out and put their prodigiously sized palm on the hood of your car and say, kid, we don't do that around here. I mean, real elders. <laughs> real elders. And... Um, and in, a, in a, uh, contrasting that with a landscape where, you know, more or less in Sacramento, anything goes, whatever the cops didn't catch you doing, you were, you were fine with. Um, the, um, you know, consequently, um, my grandmother, who uh, lived in the small town, you know, was 10 years in her, uh, her last 10 years was more or less bed bedridden, and 15 people in town played a consequential role in, in making it possible for her to grow old successfully in that small town. Um, conversely, my mother in Sacramento ended up in an assisted care for her last 15 years, you know, in an institution. There's basically three choices I came to the conclusion of. There's a, there's a, um, uh, there's institutions and there's all that we all try to do to make those institutions better and better all the time. And yet it's a huge challenge. It's just, it seems like an impossible task, really. In fact, you know, one of my favorite advocates for seniors, Bill Thomas, argues that, you know, you can take 20 seniors on a boat to a desert island and they will do better at providing for themselves than any institution we have yet created. That's an odd and uh, perhaps some truth to it, unfortunate statement though. And it makes sense, you know, I was, I was listening to, um, uh, I don't know if any of you are interested in the Thursday morning questions by the, uh, the Scottish Parliament. It's just a, a fetish I got into a few years ago. <laughs> the, the Wednesday questions with the English Parliament. But, um, you know, seniors have been, you know, the, the Scots really have the desire of being state of the art in terms of providing for seniors. And they have really established a, an incredible network of institutions. And yet, recently, there was a, an elongated complaint session at Parliament about um, how you know impersonal and all the rest it is, and um, in fact, one woman was complaining that she, in the course of a year, had one hundred and thirty three different caregivers you know some care one caregiver in the morning and a different caregiver in the evening. Some of that care is quite intimate, and um, obviously it's uh, it 's uh, destabilizing to say the least to have all these different people coming and touching your body and all the rest. The second possibility, of course, is the single family house. You know, the, the panacea, the holy grail has always been the notion of aging in place. Um, personally, I think that's a pretty sizable pathology in our, in our North American cultures. And they figured that out in Europe a while ago as well. And I'll chat, chat about the mechanisms that they've been using to shift that in recent years. But, you know, last year uh, in, Amer in the U.S. alone, Americans drove 5 billion miles, 5 billion miles just serving seniors at home. That's just Meals on Wheels and um, Nurses on the Go. And, um, you know, it's pathological from an isolation point of view. It's pathological from an environmental point of view. Uh, my uh, nephew, who provides for seniors in Eugene, Oregon, says the absolutely worst part of his job is when he leaves every day and people start crying. It's a setup, frankly. It's a setup for unhappiness, um, loneliness, the number one cause of suicide for seniors, for example. Um, it's a setup for global warming. There's just so many reasons that we have to reimagine. 
you know, back to my grandmother, there's a small town, there's a community possibility. And that possibility, I, I'm growing, you know, increasingly optimistic about all the time. Watching 20 or 30 seniors in a, um, in a community-like setting where they very much watch out for themselves, they very much establish uh, mechanisms to, um, to uh, you know, very much heighten their own quality of life. It reminds me a lot of the... Um, the philosopher Ludwig um, Wittgenstein, who writes a lot about how, you know, no matter what you do in the context of a small thread, no matter how small the thread, you can make a strong rope, you can make a strong twine with these little pieces of twine. No single twine actually provides the strength for its full length, but together they, they accomplish it. So I live in a co-housing community of 34 houses, 57 adults, 20 um, uh, 20 of those are seniors, 65 and older. And recently, um, Leo Portis, an 80-year-old woman, had a, a lump the size of a, a tumor the size of a lemon removed from her breast. But previous to that, she was an incredibly strong and contributing member of our little co-housing community. Um, uh, Gloria, uh, 80 years old as well, you know, has about 70% capacity, but 30% of the time she doesn't have a, 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 you know, a strong ability to contribute to the community. Nira just turned 85. Um, let's say 70% of the time she's contributing in a strong way. But together, they managed to um, stitch together a community that is very strong, incredibly thriving, based on when they do have their strengths and they can bring their strengths to the table. They create a strength that obviously no individual could ever hope to accomplish. And... Um, and it transcends the weaknesses. You know, on, back to my mother who ended up in assisted care for 15 years. You know, it doesn't take much in the way of um, not being able to care for yourself when you're isolated. Sometimes it's 5%, sometimes it's 10%. But it doesn't take much before you have to go to an institution to be safe. Otherwise, you might fall down and not be found, or you might have some um, difficulty that makes it absolutely essential for you to have care in a timely fashion. Well, that is very much the case in our little co-housing community. I mean, people are very readily available to help anybody as needed, and they do, and we do, and it's an honor to do so because we've grown to appreciate these seniors over the years of not only making a new community, but them making dinner, them making quilts, them doing so many other things to, to contribute to the cachet that we all know that they have in them if we allow that to, to, to rise to the top. Like the cream that they really are, their life experiences has so much to offer. For example, the 37 children that live in our co-housing community as well. Now, when, I t when, we, when you, hear, you hear a lot about co-housing, what does it mean? Well, it only means there's only four consistent <coughs> factors that go into the um, definition of co-housing. One is the future residents play a huge role in the design and the development. You know, I've designed over 50 co-housing communities now, seen them get built. I'm headed to Chilliwack tomorrow where we have a 33-unit project under construction. And, um, and people often say to me, Chuck, you're an architect. Why don't you just design the next one? I'm sure it'll be fine. And yet, I find that every time I get together for three or four days and sit down with 20 or 30 seniors, for example, the neighborhood they put together is so much more profound than I could have imagined myself. Myself, they bring real values to the table, real lives, real experiences, and, um, and it's just so rich and so giving. They know exactly what they need, frankly, if it, in a very facilitated conversation. They know exactly how to make a place that not only contributes to community, but also absolutely honors privacy. You know, when you walk onto a co-housing community, without, without exception, the goal is always to allow for as much privacy as you want and allow for as much community as you want. Unfortunately, most of our environments allow for as much privacy as you want or as much privacy as you want. <laughs> and um, in other words, not much choice. And I find that when you really get down to the nitty gritty, people appreciate choice. People appreciate the ability at, when their mood is such to be able to walk out their front door and have a cup of tea with their neighbors, for example. Um, so back to my grandmother in this small town. You know, here she was 10 years bedridden. Here she very much wanted to stay in this town. And, um, and 15 different people came, you know, to the, 
to, uh, to play a role in her well-being. One of them paid, um, was not very much, a few hours a day, a couple hours a day, but the rest of them did so because she brought so much cachet to that town for so many years. She was a, you know, a, 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 a very real mentor when it came to quilting, when it came to canning, and so many other things that obviously, um, in a traditional sense of the word, um, means that you, you know, you have, you have earned a, a considerable amount of respect and, um, and we all want to be there for you when you need us. Too many settings don't allow for us, uh, for those seniors, to cash in on, um, on uh, you know, what they have brought to the table for so many years. I say those seniors. You know, I asked my wife recently, I, just, I turned 58 recently, I said, Katie, do I look 58? She said, she said no, darling, but you used to. What's up with that? See, you need a community when you don't get it from your spouse, right? Um, um, you know, I, um, I hope this is a, a little bit of a, of a um, teaser about tonight. I have a lot of slides to show you tonight about, um, you know, issues regarding um, uh, this possibility for seniors to get together and make a state-of-the-art home, co-home. Um, if you will, a neighborhood, frankly. You know, I first discovered co-housing when I was going to the University of Copenhagen, not through a school program or anything else, but every day on my 20-minute walk, walk to the train station from a suburb in a suburban town, I walked by, you know, single-family house, no life between the buildings. Um, a, um, apartments, no life between the buildings. Strata, as you call them here in Canada, no life between the buildings. I happened to walk by an assisted care, no life between the buildings. And then yet there was this one neighborhood where almost every single day I noticed four or five people sitting at the picnic table having a cup of tea, um, chatting, talking about the issues of the day, um, either in the, in the morning but even more likely in the afternoon. So one day I stopped and I said, in my broken Danish, what's going on here? And this woman replied in her perfect English, um, <laughs> that, um, you know, that her and her husband had grown up in a town, in a neighborhood that made sense from a social point of view, and they wanted that for their children, and they weren't going to take any chances. They, were gonna, um, they felt the need to make it themselves, otherwise it's a little bit of a crapshoot. You may or may not know your neighbor in any given neighborhood that you, in any given neighborhood that you live in, and, um, and uh, you know, to them, it was, in fact, a very conservative notion that, in fact, I'm going to take this time to make, I'm going to take a couple years to make, you know, there's a single family house, there's the, there's the job, there's all the things, there's the house, there's the job, there's all the things that make a difference in the well-being of my life. But these guys were positive that a neighborhood not only made a big difference in their life, but the raisings of their children and for them when they grew older. I mean, I, I can't tell you how many co-housing communities where I live, four seniors since we moved in 10 years ago have actually died on site. And, um, you know, one, you know, moved in at 95. And, um, uh, and interestingly enough, she, she had her house was right next to the parking lot at her insistence um, to her children. And then ultimately she ended up buying, retrading that in for the house furthest from the parking at 700 feet. And one day I said, Meg, why did you move from right next to the parking lot to 700 feet from your car? And she says, well, Chuck, you know, end of the day, what's going to make the biggest difference in my life is the relationship I have with my neighbors, not with my car. And, <laughs> and she was just very clear about the social components, the social aspects. So um, the other three definitions, briefly, before I forget, is it's designed to, f to facilitate a sense of neighborhood. There are extensive common facilities so that, I mean, everybody has a private house. I want to make that clear. Um, um, but there's all these, all these functions that happen in the common house, like where I live, a music room, a children's room, a couple of guest rooms for um, people to come and stay for as long as they want, it turns out. And... Um, <laughs> Well, especially when you have an elder that's uh, subsiding, basically, you know, and, and it doesn't always happen, you know, on a, on, a, on a timeline, basically. So it's been a great honor, frankly, to be able to provide for these families who come and some of them stay for months because they have a, 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 an elder um, a parent that is, is subsiding. And we all want to be there for them, actually. Um, we want to be there for the family. We want to be there for those seniors. 
And then fourth is the, um, the uh, uh, notion that they're 100% self-managed which is also, you know, takes the banks aback and all the rest. But again, I, I honestly believe, you know, we have a meeting for about two hours every month, and I honestly believe that we manage the ranch a heck of a lot better than anybody that we could pay to an, an manage the ranch. I mean, we all care about it passionately. We all think about it pretty thoroughly. And over and over and over again, I'm always amazed that... Um, I'm always amazed that um, uh, these group, this group, my r neighbors reach their potential over and over again. You know, um, it becomes very clear um, that the potential of these, all these different thinking people can actually exceed, it, by definition, should adequately be able to exceed what any in single individual would come up with on their own. In fact, I've convinced recently that the biggest problem with living in co-housing is how many times you find out that you're wrong. <laughs> because you, every time you know, you got all these A personalities. They're the ultra conservatives, if you will. These are the people who said, "No, I'm not going to be cast adrift. I'm not going to go by the way of you know the the whole um, you know single family house myth. They're going to take me out boots first, you know, and all that mythology that goes with growing older in your single family house. I'm not going to do that, and I'm not going to not going to end up in an institution. So you have to imagine these are the most ultra responsible, proactive people that you can find. But so they always come to the table every month, and they they, they walk into the room, and they're sure they have the best idea. And you know, one of the the co housing math is one plus one equals three. In other words, I have an idea, you have an idea, and together we come up with a third idea that's much better than, than, than either of them. And so every, you know, you see all these crestfallen faces month after month. Ah, this, my idea was the best. I just knew it. And then it gets refined and thought, thought through a little bit. So it's one of the, it's one of the things that encourages me about, um, you know, that whole collaborative setting. So no further ado, I'd like to um, uh, introduce some people who are, Planning projects and living in, in a co-housing. Um, Trish Carpenter, who lives in uh, a, a wonderful co-housing community in Langley, BC. Trish. Thank you very much. My husband will tell you that it took five years for him to convince me to move into co-housing. We had just built. He is a builder, and we had just built our dream home, and. Uh, he read a newspaper article on the front page of the Vancouver Sun about a group of people that wanted to build a co-housing community. And he just was hooked immediately. He thought it solved all the world's problems and he had to live there. I think... Sorry, thank you. <laughs> um, as I recall, my response to that was over my dead body. Uh, for the next five years, all he did was try and sell me on the idea, and my, my heels got dug deeper into the, into the dirt. But um, I used to tell him that uh, co-housing was like the other woman in his life, and he was going to have to choose between us. <laughs> other than the fact that I loved the home we just built and moved into, quite frankly, being in a, in a close-knit community scared me. I was afraid of giving up my privacy. Um, I was in sales at the time, and uh, the thought of having to come home and talk to my neighbors uh, didn't relish the thought at all. Luckily for both of us, Winsong took several years to come to fruition, and by that time I'd become very fond of the group that were, were developing the community, and I'd also seen some wins for myself, but I did say to my husband, we'll move in for a year, and if I don't like it, we're going to move out again. Well, 18 years later, I'm still there. My experience of living in co-housing is that I have as much privacy and quiet time as I need. But just outside my door, there's lots of opportunities to participate in the work of community or to hang out with a neighbor and have some good conversations. Winsong's great for couples. Uh, in my marriage, my husband's a social butterfly and I need a lot more quiet time. So of an evening, if I've got my nose buried in a good book and he feels like you know, having a conversation with someone, he can just wander down to the common house. There might be an activity going on, like a games night, or, or he might just find a neighbor and catch up on the news. Um, I've got another neighbor who um, used to, for many years, worked for one of the large oil companies as a, an industrial electrician. And uh, he wanted early retirement, but he was really um, concerned about retirement because he was afraid he was going to be bored and lonely. His wife uh, traveled a lot with her work. 
and um, he, he was moving into co-housing. He became part of the building and maintenance team. He's in seventh heaven. He can putz around the community, do as much work or as little work as he wants, depending on how he's feeling, and he gets paid for it as well. So it's great for, great for, for, for couples. Prior to getting married, I, I had done a lot of traveling. You can probably tell I have an accent. My, my parents think I sound Canadian, but uh, you probably don't. Uh, I've lived in New Zealand, I've lived in England, and I've lived in Canada. And um, I'm not a shy person, but I can honestly say that when I land in a new city, it takes a long time, and I find it a struggle to make friends and to feel like I belong. But at Winsong, everybody knows my name. Everybody knows what my interests are. Uh, they'll email me about events that they know that I'd appreciate. And if I go away on holidays, by the time I get back, uh, they're all really glad to see me because I'm missed. Um, if you've lived in a small town and you know your neighbours, uh, where people help one another, you've experienced community. Winsong and all co-housing communities do that intentionally. And what Winsong has done for me is it's more than satisfied my need to belong. One of the wins for myself in moving into co-housing that I saw for myself initially was uh, the opportunity to learn and to grow more comfortable in my own skin. Uh, we always tell future residents who are coming to Winsong to buy a home that you're buying the most expensive personal growth course you'll ever take and we're throwing a house in for free. <laughs> for me, it's been worth every penny. 18 years ago, I was extremely uncomfortable with conflict. I was very uncomfortable speaking in front of large groups. And um, uh, I, had, I had difficulty asking for help. I've learned that the group process, uh, actually I'll start by saying um, I've also learned the importance of listening, really listening to my neighbours. Uh, the group decision making process in, in co-housing where we listen to one another, where we give input and where the uh, eventual decision that comes out of that discussion is way better than anything I could formulate on my own. I have learned that it's so safe to show up in front of my neighbours and speak my mind because they know me, they care about me, and they're interested in what I have to say. I'm also surrounded by a diverse group of people with many, many talents and knowledgeable about things that I don't know anything about. I've taken belly dancing lessons, I've learned Tai Chi, I've become an accomplished facilitator, I've fallen in love with gardening, I'm a beekeeper, and uh, I'm, I've also become much more politically active. And all of these things are directly a result of rubbing, rubbing shoulders with my neighbours. I'm also the building and maintenance team coordinator at Winsong. Winsong are self-managed. We have an excellent building and maintenance team, and it's my job to coordinate the work that they do. All of these things I did not see in my future, and I enjoy every single one of them. I could go on and on. I've learned so much living in co-housing. Winsong is a multi-generational co-housing community. I love being around the children. I like watching them grow and blossom. There are three generations of my family living at Winsong. Uh, I, one of the things I cherish is having my seven-year-old granddaughter pop in before she goes to bed to give me a hug good night. My son and daughter-in-law moved in just before she was born. Sadly, their relationship did not last, but they really wanted their daughter to live in co-housing because it's a safe, caring place for children. And so they, they still live there. They both live in different houses. Um, so my granddaughter actually has three homes all within walking distance in our community. This is not a unique situation in co-housing. I think if you checked most of the co-housing communities throughout North America, this would, this would be happening time and time again. And it's not the first time it's happened at Winsong. The community did not take sides in their breakup. In fact, they supported and respected them for the choices that they were making. Over the 18 years that I've lived at Winsong, I've had friends become terminally ill and others that have gone into assisted living. I can honestly say that every single one of them was able to stay in the community for a lot longer because of all the support that they got from their neighbours. Whether it was meals cooked, shopping done, just visiting, reading a book. Unlike seniors co-housing, which Margaret's going to talk about next, Winsong doesn't have a live-in caregiver, so all, all support is ad hoc and voluntary. But none of us can expect our families to take care of us when that time comes for ourselves. 
So it's really nice having neighbours who have the time and the willingness to give us that kind of support. About a year ago, a group of us formed a seniors group to talk about ageing and place in our community and how could we make that better. We meet every week, we have a lot of fun, we go on outings, we've had speakers come in talking on different topics. But the real goal is to get to know each other better. We talk about ageing and what that means to us and how we can support one another when the time comes. It's helped me uh, get out of denial about my own ageing. It's helped me get my paperwork in order. And I've become even closer friends with that group. I'm also part of a group of facilitators that's putting on a workshop this fall, both at Simon Fraser and at Quantland Polytechnic, called Aging Well in Community, so that we can help others age and thrive in their senior years. I'm not saying that Winsong is utopia, far from it. We're a diverse group of individuals with different beliefs, different interests, different values. Conflict happens, but we are a group of individuals who are committed to sorting through our differences through communication and through help if we need it with our neighbours. I think this is a wonderful thing to demonstrate to our children and grandchildren. And for me, it's helped me be more effective in my life. I'm no longer afraid of conflict. I'm talking in front of a large group, and I'm definitely more at ease with myself. Thank you. So I think that probably every one of you in this room uh, knows about the silver tsunami, right? It's the uh, demographic surge of baby boomers born between 1946 and 64, who are turning 65 in Canada at the rate of 1,000 every day and they'll do so until uh, the year 2030. I think it's 10,000 a day in the US. There's a lot of concern about the impact of the silver tsunami from those of us who are growing older. I'm a second year baby boomer. Uh, and from those who are expected to look after us. And from those concerned about the people and the environment that will be our legacy. Where's the, is that to it? Uh-oh. Uh-oh. There we go. Um, fear arises easily um, when we look at the options that are available to our parents now. And this amazing cover of McLean's magazine says it all. When I look at the options of, that were available to my mother, I realized they were nice, but I didn't want any of them. And what was worse, I couldn't afford them. She's now living in a place in the States that charges $10,000 a month. <clears throat> yeah. Baby, uh, until she can't pay for it anymore, then that's another question. Um, baby boomers, uh, according to the McLean's article, had fewer children than previous generations. So our potential for being a burden to our children is spread amongst fewer offspring. And for those without children, where do we turn for family like support as we age? We're living 25 years longer than people did in 1900. So the prospect of outliving our savings uh, increases, especially as our generation is chastised for having saved so little toward retirement. And the system worries about everything from baby boomers' potential demands on medical care to our history of degrading the health of the planet. Now, I think fear should be a wake-up call, but it's not a way of life, and it shouldn't be. How about turning fear into positive energy, uh, into a sense of possibility unlike anything that the world has seen since the 1960s? Ask yourself how you might flourish. This is a little uh, slide of a flip chart that was done in one of our courses using the, uh, the word flourish down the left-hand side. You're living longer. As we've heard in previous papers, people are living lo healthier lives for longer, and even becoming super centenarians. So what, can you, what would you do with a gift of extra time in your wild and precious life? Think about it. This is the first step, thinking about it. And after that, there are many paths toward flourishing as we age. What inspires you? What activates your energy? What makes you feel like you could be the change? So to me, now is our moment. Um, could be our last chance. 
the world needs the energy of the people in the baby boomer generation. It needs you, it needs me. And here's the important part, we need each other. Did you know that social isolation is more likely to kill you than smoking? Especially if you don't smoke, you might say. But uh, statistics, stats show that the risk, mortality risk of social isolation is greater than um, the mortality risk of smoking. So social connection is the key to flourishing in old age. It's probably the key to flourishing at any age, um, and yet social interaction is so undervalued in our individualistic society. For this conference, then, a central question becomes, how can housing support flourishing through social connection in an aging society? Harborside Co-Housing, of which I am delighted to be a founding member in Souk, British Columbia, on the island outside Victoria, Harborside Co-Housing is a prototype. It is the second senior co-housing in Canada after Wolf Willow in Saskatoon. It is the first, however, to include a suite for a caregiver. It's a, a below market suite, a rental suite uh, in our common house for a potential caregiver. It's also the first to include an emphasis on the active development of co-care or voluntary neighborly support, which tends to occur, as you've heard from uh, Charles and Tricia in co-housing. And we're really focusing on that in Harborside. Uh, and third, Harborside is the only co-housing in the world, as far as we know, to have a required course for membership. There is no final exam, but you have to take the course. Harborside's process has been to build the group, um, the group first. The group came well before anything else. Uh, and we began to build the group beginning in late 2010. And then we found the site and uh, made the offer on the site in September 2012. It's a spectacular waterfront site um, in the center of our small and rather underdeveloped town of Souk, a former, um, well, not former logging community, still a logging community and a fishing community. The site, the co-housing site, includes a resort building, which we bought, um, that is suitable for our common house and a commercial grade wharf. The owner of the resort property became a founding member of the co-housing. We hired Renee Matthew as project manager in 2013. We expect to begin construction this summer and to move in next summer. We continue to invest as much energy in creating community agreements and glue as we do in design and financial decisions. Although we are senior co-housing, we have no age restriction. Our members range in age from 47 to 90 and include three generations. We have two mothers, one father, our age generation, and two children who are not their grown children. Every unit uh, has a south-facing view of Souk Harbor. This is our landscape design, but it gives you a sense of it. The harbor is at the bottom. There's a public walkway, which we've deeded to the district of Souk, which is the, the little stepping stones across the waterfront end. Um, so every unit has an unobstructed south-facing view of Souk Harbor. It's quite a steep site, which has posed its own problems for senior co-housing, runaway wheelchairs. But uh, <laughs> the uh, terracing of the site, which is already uh, was there when we bought it, uh, allows each site, each um, unit, to have this beautiful view. And we look out over the Strait of Juan de Fuca and the Olympic Mountains beyond. We believe that Harborside will be the first co-housing in Canada, senior or otherwise to have sold all of our 31 units before construction starts. 90% of our membership is already in place. The next steps beyond Harborside. Um, the Canadian Senior Co-Housing Society, which gave rise to Harborside, proposes to adapt principles of co-housing, which Chuck described, to the needs of an aging population in Canada. Thanks to Charles Durrett, we know that co-housing is already very well established in Europe. He has shown us that co-housing encourages social connection, affordability, reduced energy consumption, green building, participation, and a sense of collective responsibility. Tricia and Alan Carpenter and others at Winsong blazed the trail for co-housing in Canada. 
and Charles certainly did this, and, his, and Katie did the same in the U.S. We follow very respectfully in their footsteps with Canadian Senior Co-Housing, a nonprofit society that, in, that first encourages the development of senior co-housing in Canada, beginning with Harborside. Second, uh, Canadian Senior Co-Housing Society created an experiential weekend workshop, Aging Well in Community, which we're now calling Dare to Age Well in Community, that, and there are handouts um, at the ba at, near the entrance to this room with my poster. Uh, and this workshop opens participants to many possibilities, including co-housing. The course, as I said, is required for membership in Harborside. We offer it through Royal Roads University, and we take it on the road. Uh, we bring it to uh, communities uh, mainly on Vancouver Island. We trained Tricia and her colleagues in source facilitation to offer the course in the Vancouver area and on the Lower Mainland, so they're happy to do that. And they will be offering it a, a variant of it. They've, we've all uh, made it our own. Uh, they, so their variant will be offered through Simon Fraser University and Kwantlen, apparently, College University. Um, the third uh, focus of Canadian Senior Co-Housing Society has been to seek funding, and we're just beginning to embark on this funding to document the development of senior co-housing in Canada and extract the best practices. I'm an academic by background, a professor of anthropology at York University, so there's something in my soul that just calls out to document what's happening here. <laughs> so any students in the room, see me later. Uh, or faculty for that matter. We see co-housing, senior co-housing, as a major social innovation. In 15 years' time, seniors will be approximately a third of the population. Um, 10 million people or more will be over 55 in Canada. And if just 1% of this population wanted to take advantage of, oh, I should have changed my slide, um, if only 1% of this population wanted to take advantage of senior co-housing in its present model, we would need 2,000 projects harborside side, size across the country. The reality is that we would be lucky to provide 200 projects, which would only provide for 0.1% of the senior population. The demand for senior co-housing, I believe, is limited by three obstacles. Uh, the first is affordability. Co-housing uh, strata titled home ownership co-housing, which is what we have in BC, is basically market housing. It may be a nonprofit development in which the owners um, are the developers, but it still comes in at close to market cost. People need equity to buy into senior co housing under the current model of strata titled home ownership. The second obstacle is the sc a scarcity of project management capacity. You're looking at probably two thirds of it right here at this <coughs> table. Um, and uh, it's limited to the energy and skills of very few firms concentrated in British Columbia and California. If you look at the Canadian Co-Housing Network map of the country and see where the co-housings are located, a few in Quebec, um, Ontario, and scattered across the country, I think seven are in BC. Uh, the third obstacle is just plain inertia. Uh, people just have trouble getting out of denial. Uh, the idea that you're not ready, and we've heard this so many times, and our members tend to be in their 50s and 60s, and we've gotten our heads around the idea that, yeah, we're ready. Uh, what are we waiting for? People want to age in place, they're wary of change, they're not ready. Uh, so that's a huge obstacle in itself. Working to soften these barriers, then, Canadian Senior Co-Housing believes um, that, Canadian, um, that senior co-housing itself can be a major social innovation if we focus on the software. Not so much the new construction, because that's where the costs are so high, but in adapting co-housing values to a wide range of housing forms and potential demand. I, would, I said we'd be lucky to build uh, senior co-housing for 0.1% of the senior population. So what happens to the other 99.9% .9 of people who are elderly? This is where we need to get really inventive. How about retrofitting the culture of existing buildings, such as stratas? How about re retraining strata councils? How about uh, changing the culture of how neighborhoods? 
of houses, housing for seniors of all sorts and of housing cooperatives with the values that are such as co-care, voluntary, mutual, neighborly support that are already apparent in co-housing. In this way, much closer to 100% of the elderly population can benefit from what we have learned in co-housing. We formed a partnership with the Community Social Planning Council in Victoria, and we're looking for other partners who want to scale senior co-housing up and out through innovative ways of reducing costs and encouraging shared leadership and responsibility. Uh, we're developing an aging well and community matrix, handouts at the back, for expressing our holistic approach that is central to my poster here called Surfing, Senior Co-Housing, Surfing the Silver Tsunami. So in conclusion, I invite you to visit my poster. It's the one <coughs> now closest to the registration desk. It has traveled already since this morning. From it, deep in this room, it has journeyed out to near the registration desk. Uh, and uh, come and talk to me. I hope you'll share my excitement about Harborside and about the possibility that senior co-housing holds to become a trans transformative social innovation. I believe our children will thank us for senior co-housing because we will be safe, happy, and not a burden to them. Those without kids will thank their own good judgment. I believe society will thank us for senior co-housing because of the dollars we will save the healthcare system I believe the construction industry will thank us for coming up with a replicable model for housing that seniors want and will buy. Most of all, I believe we will thank ourselves for the gifts that senior co-housing offers, gifts of friendships, green, accessible, and affordable housing, and the opportunity to lead, learn, and grow as we age. Thank you. Hi, everybody. Uh, great to see everybody uh, out today. Hopefully you can uh, hear me okay. Um, my name's Alan Forrester. And uh, I first saw Chuck speak, I think, in 2009 at the uh, Caresdell Community Center. And uh, I've been involved, uh, quite involved in co-housing ever since. And uh, so keep that in mind if you come and see Chuck speak, or all of us for that matter. Um, and I just want to make a clarification as well. I think uh, Jack said I was uh, had produced many co-housing projects in Vancouver or something like that uh, in, in the intro. And um, there actually isn't any co-housing in the city of Vancouver proper. Uh, one starts construction uh, basically right now, and we're in the very early days of uh, planning a second project right now as well. But uh, <coughs> there's, uh, there's not a lot of co-housing uh, in, uh, in, in, in the city of Vancouver, but there, there are a number of projects in Greater Vancouver, as uh, Patricia was saying. Um, right now, we're currently planning uh, a seniors friendly 25 to 30 unit co housing community. And I'll take you w through some slides and just give you sort of a little bit of a case study for how we approach it and, and how we uh, tend to think about it. But uh, all that being said, you know, I do have to say that. Uh, you know, we're here talking about uh, seniors' housing and we're talking about affordability. And, you know, Vancouver uh, is always uh, comes up very high on the list of being a very expensive city, often coming in uh, as being deemed the second most expensive city in the world after Hong Kong. And, you know, we have to, to keep that in mind that it, uh, uh, it, it, it's a challenge. And, you know, I think back to when I first saw Chuck speak and I thought, oh, there's going to be co-housing all over Vancouver, isn't this great? And, and there will. Uh, but uh, but it is early days still, and it is challenging to produce, and, and part of that is the uh, the cost issue. Um, but co-housing has all kinds of uh, affordability measures woven into what co-housing is, and uh, and we need to be creative, looking forward. Margaret had some great comments, and and uh, and there are uh, solutions out there for sure. Um, but in my view, there's a bit of a supply problem with co-housing. We, uh, we need to produce more of it. So I'll just uh, turn to some slides now. Hmm. Margaret, how do I advance oh, that? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> just a second. I'm out of my chair. It's tight up here. Oh. It's this. That one. Gotcha. 
Great. Okay, and that would be back. Yeah, thank you. Great. So um, that's just a slide of uh, the Senior Co-Housing book. It's a great resource. Chuck wrote that book, and uh, we encourage anyone who's interested in seniors co-housing to get a copy of that. Now, I mentioned uh, a case study. We're in the very early days of planning uh, a, a project that is senior friendly. And this is a uh, Keyside in North Vancouver, so I'm going to take you through some very specific images of, uh, of that project. And you'll see different than Margaret's docks and boats and forests and all that kind of stuff. We're talking about, you know, urban location. And in this case, this is a four story. It's actually with that little store, a five story building. And uh, I spend a lot of time in this co-housing project. And I'm actually making dinner there this Friday. <laughs> I've eaten a lot of co-housing dinners, but I've yet to make one, so that'll be kind of fun. And um, this is a pro it's 19 homes, two of them are rental. And this project's been there for about 16 years or so. And I would encourage anyone who's interested to go and uh, arrange a tour at some point. They're very welcoming of people to do that. And the reason I'm showing you these slides is we anticipate building a four-story co-housing project. It's early days, that could change, and it depends on how our land deal works, but uh, nonetheless, these are sort of the early stage visions that we have. And sorry, if someone wants to be uh, time police and give me if I don't want to run away over. But uh, anyhow, so this is a key side. It's quite a small footprint. This is an FSR of about two. That may not mean a lot to, 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 to you. But again, it's about 19 homes, four stories. You can see the common courtyard here. It's not a huge courtyard. The common house sits right by the entry. Uh, and I'm in, on a funny angle, so I sort of have trouble <laughs> seeing. But the common house area is right by the entry to the building. And uh, in the many co-housing projects I've toured and been through, it's certainly one of my favorites. And uh, this is, uh, again, a shot of the, the four stories and, and the common house area sits right in here. And here's a, uh, uh, one of the homes, uh, a one bedroom, 660 square feet. So, you know, that looks not dissimilar to what you might see in other uh, real estate situations, of course. Um, this is uh, uh, the, one of the uh, upper floors. And what fa I find fascinating about this project is when you, it has outdoor corridors and, and those turn into gardens and uh, it's a very welcoming, uh, people growing vegetables or flowers or whatever it may be. So I'm just gonna go through this very quickly. Uh, these are some of the common health elements, the common kitchen, uh, sort of a common uh, uh, sitting area. Uh, th these guys do an excellent job of recycling for 40 some odd people who live there. I think they produce one garbage can of garbage every two weeks. But they've been running it that way for you know 15 years. That's the incredible thing for a long time. Um, this is a, a real uh, centerpiece for the community. It's how they communicate amongst other other measures as well. And uh, so here's the common a common house dinner. And uh, this is actually, I think, the mayor uh, making dinner and one of the councillors. And that's Kathy, who lives in co-housing, who will be speaking later on at the conference. And actually, she should be up here explaining this because she lives there. But here I am. And, um, you know, co-housing, it's a bit of a roll up your sleeves kind of thing in many ways with your neighbors. We've heard a lot about that already. But uh, I know, as Kathy likes to say, Kathy wasn't pouring concrete that day. She was making the chili, I think, something like that <laughs> for lunch and uh, a celebration uh, uh, as well, spring celebration. Um, and just more common house activities. Uh, this is Wolf Willow that uh, was briefly mentioned earlier. It's five stories, I believe, and that's in Saskatchewan. That's uh, Canada's first seniors co-housing and then Margaret's, Margaret's uh, just getting going on, uh, in, from a construction point of view on the second one shortly. And uh, also, this is uh, uh, in uh, Burnaby, Cranberry Commons. Uh, again, the, the common house and the common kitchen. And here would be uh, a bedroom, uh, a guest bedroom. So you don't need to have extra bedrooms in your home. You can squeeze down your space a little bit. And um, uh, that helps from an affordability point of view. And they have an extensive workshop. Some people get very excited about uh, that photo. Some people don't. <laughs> Whoops, I think I just did something. There we go. 
And I thought I'd mention, uh, this is uh, Vancouver, uh, the first Vancouver co-housing project, and it'll start construction. Uh, if you drive by there today, you can see the buildings have been demolished and such, and it'll look something like that upon completion. And there's a layout, it's 31 homes, two of those are rentals, it's got extensive uh, common areas, and architectural drawings and such. Uh, I, I put this slide up, um, you know, schedule, and uh, I think, for example, there's me and there's Chuck, and this is one of the very early planning meetings, a little over two years ago. And uh, then, you know, drawings occur and many co-housing meetings and they go through that planning process. And then this was about uh, two months ago with snow on the ground, obviously, and you can see the construction fencing went up. And you know, you work on this for so long. I actually worked on this site, I shouldn't say this, but for five years prior to uh, going co-housing, but anyhow, that's another story. But finally you get to a point, and, and with all the meetings and discussions and planning process that goes on, and finally you hit a point where the construction fencing goes up. That was pretty exciting, at least to me anyway. And then if you drive by this location at 33rd and Commercial today, those houses uh, have been demolished, and construction starts uh, early next week. And so right now we're in the very early days of group formation and we're looking at different sites. And, um, you know, we, we do talk about Caresdale as a possible location, but uh, we have a broader uh, perspective than that. It might be uh, further east than that. Uh, very early days still in this. And uh, just, um, I, I failed to uh, put my, the, the website information in the handout, but uh, there's a, a website, walktocohousing.ca. You'll see a lot of information there. Uh, that's my email address, obviously, and phone number. So if you had any uh, comments or anything to suggest, uh, we, we would uh, encourage that. Great. Thanks. So what we've heard is, you know, it's funny. There is a the saying, um, it reminds me of a saying, that uh, it takes a village to, to raise a child. Well, I think we can add it takes a village to take care of our elderly so, um, as well. So uh, we do have, uh, there's only thing, there's about 10 minutes between now and lunch, so I have to keep everybody here till lunchtime. No, I'm just kidding. But uh, <laughs> if there are questions, or as, as uh, Gloria said, there is mics up there, and um, if you'd like to just fire away, and we'll hopefully we'll get the uh, panelists to, uh, to answer all your questions before lunchtime. Okay. Thank you. I have, is it on? Um, my name is Sherry Baker, and I live in Langley, very close to Windsong, and remember going through it when it was first built, shortly after it was first built, and it had a lovely ambience to it, which is 18 years ago. Um, if I were to choose to go into such a, 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 a housing, and after a period of time found that I needed to move into assisted living or I passed away, how would one get that one's equity out of that uh, and because I assume that you you have to be accepted by the other people in the in the in the co-housing unit, and that would might take some time. Um, Winsong, like all, all well, like most uh, co-housing communities, is a strata title townhome development. We do not screen future residents. Um, it's self-selecting and you would list your home with the community. The community would help you sell it. We have a long waiting list of people wanting to get in. Uh, the turnover is not particularly brisk. Um, I sold a home at Winsong in uh, February. Uh, there was a bidding war that went on for it and they got about 15,000 over asking. So um, selling a home and co-housing is easier than buying one, I think. Wow, <laughs> that's, you know, that's actually good news, but thank you. Is there any other panelists who would like to answer or put any input to that? That's the answer. Uh, can you hear me? Yep. Um, yeah. I'm a retired academic uh, for almost 20 years. Uh, when I was 40, I couldn't imagine being 80. <laughs> uh, when I was 65, I couldn't imagine what it would be like to be living my life 20 years later. Uh, I'm kind of curious about this um, super, uh, super centarian um, idea. Um, 
of a feeling that uh, I could not possibly imagine today what it would be like to be 20 years older than I am now. The um, co-housing seems to start, as I understand it, with um, a process of self-selection into a coherent social group. Um, so my question is, how can that be made an almost instant process so that people who are 80 can be planning <laughs> for co-housing <coughs> this year or next year, not when they're 90? Yeah, I had a, a, I was working with a senior group uh, a couple months ago, and this, this older woman said to me, she said, Chuck, uh, you know, let's make this thing happen. I don't even buy green bananas anymore. <laughs> And, um, you know, it's interesting. We, uh, we work on a fair amount of other senior housing projects besides senior co-housing. And I'm always impressed with, uh, you get a group of people to the table, how fast the project goes. I mean, you know, project after project, including the one here in Vancouver that uh, Alan was showing, we did the site plan in four days. That's about as instant as you can get, basically. And yet, um, and yet there seems so much reticence to getting real people involved. I mean, so many quote, quote, developers and builder types think, oh, I can just do this faster, but then of course they're second guessing themselves forever. That's what happens over and over again. They come running into the office at 4 p.m. saying, don't hand it to the building department tomorrow. We actually have to put you know, the party shower in. That's the new thing in the magazine, right? And instead, you know, I find causing groups, they go over and over again, no, we made a decision, we're moving forward. Um, and uh, so the best way to get serious about it is you start with a group of people. I mean, my job is over and over again, starting with 40 or 50 strangers and saying, okay, how do we get this thing going? But um, you know, one of the things I love about working with senior co-housing compared to intergenerational co-housing is they are so impatient. You know, let's get this thing done, Durrett. So, I mean, that's the best way to get involved. I mean, the best, best way to make it happen in a hurry is get involved or, you know, or find an existing project like uh, Trisha's, but the, like she said, there's a long waiting list. And um, you know, tomorrow will be here before you know it. So um, you know, the best thing to do is get involved. Um, uh, we found with uh, Harborside that there was a, a lot of reluctance amongst our, our potential older members to get involved early on. Um, people would say, oh, I won't live long enough for that. And then as we've approached the um, start of construction and people can see that we'll be moving in next summer, we've had a huge upsurge in membership. Um, so yeah, we went from, I think, 19 equity members to now we're at 28. We do still have t two units available, so we could talk later. <laughs> Alan or Trish, no? Anything else? No? Okay. Um, my name is uh, Catherine Willett. I work in a nonprofit sector and I'm also a single person, so I won't be able to afford uh, one of your, your two units. Um, and, and given that, I want to go off a little bit on a tangent. Uh, all my life, I've lived in apartment buildings, um, and I guess, given my um, outgoing personality and, and also uh, the fact that often I've had a dog, uh, I have found it... Um, not always uh, difficult to build a sense of community in the building where I actually lived. Um, and then I uh, moved out to Richmond for three years. Um, I learned I'm not a suburbanite. I found it very lonely out there because I work from home. Um, but one day I... I just delivered invitations along the street and I had a garden party and everyone showed up and one woman said, you know, I've lived here 47 years and no one has had a garden party. Like, they didn't even know each other's <coughs> names. 
and I was completely stunned. Um, and we, you know, part of what we're talking about here is building a community. Uh, I know that the people in my apartment building probably aren't going to be my caregiver in uh, 30 years. Uh, but if we're talking about community, uh, one of the things that I, I think is is missing from this conference, and I understand why, uh, is what can we all do as individuals, or more, what is our personal responsibility in building community in the buildings we live in, in the streets that we live on, and the neighborhoods that, that we live in? I don't know who is looking at that. Maybe I have to uh, find a, a conference on community development. Uh, but I just want to say, just because you know you're not a co-houser or you don't live in a co-op, uh, we I think it it bodes well for us to look at building communities where we are as we age at home. Thank you. <laughs> Yeah, that's a it's a super question, really. I mean, this whole thing about um, you know, sure, we can only get so many co-housing projects built in the the, the next generation, etc. And there's so much work to be done in our neighborhood. Um, uh, there, uh, on the one side, you know, the, di- the I'll give you the dower side and the upside here. On the dower side, there was one project in the U.S. of the 120 co-housing projects finished there. There was one where they bought a bunch of single-family houses, took down the back fences, built a common house, and made a co-housing, a very successful co-housing community. It took about seven years. Our goal typically is two to three years to get a project built. Um, You know, the organic method just takes longer. And those weren't um, existing neighbors. Those were people who bought into that as house after house became available. I mean, the, the issue is, really, one of the key issues there is that to accomplish co-housing, everybody who comes to the table, more or less, ha- there's only one common denominator. The sense that my life will be easier, more convenient, more practical, more economical, more interesting, and more fun if I give cooperation with my neighbor the benefit of the doubt. That's all you have to, you know, a- apply. And yet, that's not universal. You know, we have been so steeped in pull yourself up by the bootstrap kind of mythology. By the way, has anybody ever seen anybody pull themselves up by the bootstraps? <laughs> I mean, I keep waiting to see that one of these days. And, um, and um, you know, we're so steeped in that, in that. Now, that said, you know, I have to say, um, for me, it was a great blessing going to, uh, going to uh, school for two years in Scandinavia. And because I learned to um, appreciate this whole trade there, the whole profession called cultural workers, where they would go into a small town or a neighborhood or near a neighborhood center, and they would you know, see that the post office was tenuous and see that the grocery store was tenuous and try to make a deal with all the players to say, hey, let's bring the, the post office into the grocery store that way when you know, Mrs. Smith stops and gets her mail and has a seat, she can see Mrs. Jones, who's there to get her bread and butter, and, um, and they can see each other and talk to each other. I mean, and oddly enough, there's a great book in the U.S. called Habits of the Heart. It's the only New York bestseller to be, uh, about an, by an anthropologist, and he talks about you know, the community that we once had. But anyway... I spoke to his, um, his graduate class a few years ago, 20 graduate students, anthropology students, and I asked them, are there any of you guys who would ever be interested in becoming cultural workers? In other words, people who go into tenuous settings and try to stitch it all back together, a functioning fabric, and uh, not one of them raised their hands. And so I said, why? I described it in great detail. And, you know, one of the things they do, if any new road project, for example, has to have a, uh, be consulted by a cultural worker because if you put a road right through a town, for example, how it affects the collective kinship of grandmother, granddaughter, how often they can walk to their house and such. You know, the aggregate sum of relationships, you know, basic, you know, anthropology 101. Anyway, I asked them how many would be interested, and they all said none. Well, none. None. And I asked them why, and they said because in the U.S., 
you know, there's, there's, only the, there's only the Eiffel Tower, the white, the, the ivory tower, and the, the ivory tower, and, and, um, and writing and teaching that gets you any, anywhere. And in Denmark, uh, you know, there was just about one cultural worker in every single co-housing that we visited, 185. And these are people who basically looked at any decision of any consequence. Of course, there's the economic side and there's the bureaucratic side and all the rest. But there's the social side. Let's stop and do that math. And there's a lot of tenuous towns across North America that could be stitched back together into high-functioning communities if we just stop and did the math. Um, and, and so I would encourage the academics out there to, to go from not just studying it, but imagining how, you know, a little tweak here and a little tweak there, and all of a sudden we can, you know, stitch this tenuous societies back together. I, okay, I've got the, the thumbs up from Gloria to say we can take one more question. Um, my qu Hi, thank you. A very quick question. As a person with a disability and now reaching my older years, um, I'm particularly concerned about aging in place features in housing in general. And single family home, this is a difficult sell because People want the latest home and garden TV, kitchens and bathrooms and all of that. But co-housing may offer something, uh, an addition, I hope. Is there an opportunity or is it discussed at the co-housing formative meetings about the aging in place needs of family co-housing as well as senior? Family too. I'll, I'll address it from the senior co-housing perspective. In, uh, from the Early, well, about a year ago, I guess, we got a, a member of household with a daughter who has a disability and uses a wheelchair. And this was the greatest gift we could have had in our planning process. So we have consulted with her and then through that family's expertise around accessibility, universal design, uh, and made sure that we've reinforced ceilings for lifts if someone needs a, a lift to move from room to room. Um, we have wide enough doorways and so on. So we've designed for aging in place and aging in community. It's not to say that every part of our rather steep site is accessible, um, but you can go to the common house, the gardens, and visit anybody's home. And uh, the members have been able to uh, affect, to um, some extent, the design of their own homes with regard to accessibility. Features, But the community decided that they wanted to reinforce all of the ceilings for possible lifts um, and have all of the units accessible. So that was, um, that's been really um, uh, allowed us to be quite forward in our planning. Okay, unfortunately that's all the time we got uh, lunch. Uh, I'm running a little, a little over time, so, but on behalf of Simon Fraser University and the, the Gerontology Research Center, I'd like to thank Charles, Tricia, Margaret, and Alan, and if I can get another one, I'll follow. <laughs>